Hi, everyone. This is West Allen, National President of the Federal Bar Association. As you know, the Federal Bar Association is the nation's foremost professional organization of nearly 20,000 federal lawyers and judges across the country, dedicated to improving the federal system and the administration of justice. We do this by, among other things, sustaining and strengthening the independence of the federal judiciary, as well as increasing awareness and understanding of the United States Constitution. I invite you to join the FBA if you have not yet, but this message today is for everyone. It's for all judges, all citizens, all members of the FBA. Not long ago, I gave a presentation to my friends in San Antonio, Texas. It concerned the Constitution and how we form a more perfect union. I want to share that with a lot of you as well, so that you can have this event perhaps be a catalyst as you begin to teach and be an example to others as well. I want today's message to be about not just the Constitution, but reflections on a recurrence to fundamental principles. And I'll explain that term in just a minute. I want us to understand how to form a more perfect union. As leaders, federal judges, federal lawyers across the country, you are the ones who are the leaders of your communities. And I hope I can convey a message that will be heard by you and that you will take this message and share it with others. Let me begin by explaining what the purpose of today's discussion will be. My topic will be to discuss generally how judges and lawyers, as guardians of the Constitution, must understand and teach and defend our United States Constitution and its founding principles. Among these remarkable founding principles are those which I call the five fundamental principles, popular sovereignty, federalism, separation of powers, the Bill of Rights, and the rule of law. Today, I also want to talk about at least two other, what I would call unspoken principles of the Constitution. And I hope you will reflect on these again and again as you, on your own, study the Constitution and realize that our founders put things in the Constitution for us to discover for perhaps the 21st century, even right now. So let me begin my presentation by talking about what I'll call the Great Realization. In January, uh, January 6th, to be exact, of this year, we all experienced and saw on television a difficult event. We saw riots break out on Capitol Hill. Now, now that event affected me as it did you in some pretty profound ways. Among other things, it made me understand that the delicate nature and fragility of a republic. I want us to reflect and take a moment to realize what we have here as an American republic and really how fragile it truly is. The Events of the past year with the pandemic have given everyone a time to pause, a time to reflect upon the things that matter. And in this presentation, I want to talk about some of those things. We have a time, as it were, to come to ourselves, to understand what we have as a nation, to understand how important it is that we listen to other people. And at this moment of a, a realization of what matters in the United States and throughout the world, I want us to reflect on the great experiment of self-government that is the United States of America and our self-governing document, the Constitution of the United States. Because I truly believe at this time in our nation's history, we can either act or be acted upon. We must dust off our constitutional instincts and forge new civic habits to preserve our nation. We are entering this post-pandemic time and it truly is a time of national realization. And I propose that it's time for our nation to undergo a recurrence of fundamental constitutional principles. Now, I use that phrase carefully, recurrence of constitutional principles, because it's not mine. It belongs to our founders. In fact, I'll mention three. George Mason, in June of 1776, wrote the first Bill of Rights. He placed at the head of the Bill of Rights the sentiment for his state that, quote, no free government or the blessing of liberty can be preserved to any people but by frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. Thereafter, right after the Declaration of Independence was signed, Benjamin Franklin also wrote for his Declaration of Rights for Pennsylvania and its Bill of Rights, quote, a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles is absolutely necessary to preserve the blessings of liberty and to keep a government free. For the third witness, thereafter, John Adams in his Massachusetts Bill of Rights in 1780 confirmed the exact same phrase, and he said, quote, a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles 
of the Constitution is absolutely necessary to preserve the advantages of liberty and to maintain a free government. Now, I could repeat those again, but I think the point is well taken. At least three times we were told by our founders, three of them, that it is important upon us to remember and to understand, to have a recurrence to fundamental principles of how and why they formed this union. So what is our role as lawyers and judges, and what are we to remember? First, know that all of us, you as a federal judge or federal lawyer, and really every good citizen in the United States, we collectively are the guardians of the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights. You are its defenders, those responsible for the recurrence to the Constitution's fundamental principles. You are the ones our founders would call upon to carry on what they began, or as George Washington called it, the standard. As you know, I, one of my favorite places in all of New York City is at Washington Square Park, the nation's first capital. There, there's a magnificent arch and above it are the words of Washington and these are the words. Let us raise a standard to which the wise and the honest can repair. The event is in the hands of God. Now I reflect upon that often and I hope you do as well because George Washington, I believe, understood that what he was doing and what his founding brothers were doing and his founding sisters, what they were doing collectively was creating not just a new nation, but a proclamation of freedom throughout the world. The Constitution of the United States was going to be the written embodiment of freedom to the world. And it was going to be a work that would have to continue. They would do the beginning, they would lay the foundation, but our generation, generations that follow, would do the great work of expanding that idea of freedom throughout the world. Now, as we reflect upon the events of the past few months, I would make a call to everyone that we cannot and we must not as a nation descend into political tribalism. America is inclusive. It's the greatest hope of freedom to the world. Its constitution is that hope. Here, we build bridges of understanding for liberty not walls of segregation by tyranny. As Lincoln said, we are not enemies, but friends. Here in America, we must all be engaged in the great and noble work of forming a more perfect union and securing the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Here, all are invited to join in the internal cause of freedom. So let us know and understand first that we are the guardians of the Constitution, the ministers of justice, we are the ones who foremostly must understand, teach, and defend our United States Constitution and its founding principles. And what are those founding principles? Well, those are the five I want to talk about today. Popular sovereignty, federalism, separation of powers, the Bill of Rights, and the rule of law. I also want to talk about those two unspoken principles, which there are many, but I want to speak of two, of unity and of civic charity. What are the stakes about this topic that I'm going to discuss? Are we going to act or be acted upon? I would ask us to remember carefully the stakes and the importance of understanding right now that we have to act. Let's consider what is at stake. Self-government, the hope of this nation, democracy, all of it. One of my favorite authors is a New York professor of psychology. Jonathan Haidt is the New York University Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethics and Leadership. He has written a book, in fact I have it here, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided into Politics and Religion. I'm not pushing that book, I just want to note that he found some very interesting insights into why people are hardwired to break down into tribes. And when he was on a tour giving a, an explanation of his findings in Australia, Part of his interview was recorded in the Australian newspaper, and I wanted to share it with you. This is what he said, quote, there is a very good chance that American democracy will fail, that in the next 30 years, we will have a catastrophic failure of our democracy because we just don't know what a democracy looks like when you drain all of the trust out of the system. Consider that. We just don't know what a democracy looks like when you drain all of the trust out of the system. This notion is not new for we forget sometimes all that the Constitutional Convention has taught us. 
at the beginning of our nation, when we were very divided and where people had their own factions and their own geographic, geographical places of residence that were worlds apart, our nation had the dilemma of forging a democracy, a republic, out of so many groups and different types of people. And so I want to reflect for a minute before I talk about the fundamental principles themselves on the history of the Constitution and what its context can teach us. So let me diverge and share a story, a constitutional story of what happened at the Constitutional Convention. What exactly happened in 1787 in that hot summer in Philadelphia? Over about 116 days when 55 men, delegates from 12 states, many of whom weren't there the whole time, when they took it upon themselves to frame a new government, indeed to write a new constitution, a constitution of approximately 4,400 words, seven articles, that was the first and only time people themselves had written out their own government. The miracle of what occurred shouldn't be forgotten. It was indeed the greatest political event and the document they created, the greatest political creation in the history of the world for the cause of freedom. When we look back 233 years ago, one of the foremost things that are that's interesting to focus upon is the fact that it almost didn't work out at all. In fact, as a lot of you know, when the convention began, the concern was that it would fall to pieces, that it wouldn't work out. But the delegates who were told to go represent their citizens and forge a new government, or at least to prepare the Articles of Confederation to make it as good as they could, they understood and they had a duty to overcome what I'll think of as the natural man's desire and disposition for tribalism, as Jeff Professor Jonathan Haidt pointed out. I think they understood that they had a calling, a duty to forge ahead no matter their differences. But interestingly, by 1786, 1787 in July, they indeed were in a, quote, a deplorable state. The delegates were facing a real possibility of failure. And yet, by mid-September, they created a written constitution. How is that possible? Well, I think it's worth reflecting upon. Among other things, I want to talk about what Benjamin Franklin discussed. Benjamin Franklin, at the close of the convention, when they had finished their work, gave a speech. And in his speech, he started to explain a little bit, I believe, of what happened to make it possible for the parties to get together and put together a constitution that would be accepted. It certainly wasn't confirmed that it was going to be accepted. In fact, there were a lot of people who were quite sure that it wouldn't pass at all. But here are the words of Benjamin Franklin as he rose and gave a speech about what I will start to discuss a little bit later today, this idea of unity and civic charity. Mr. Franklin rose and said to George Washington, who was the president of the convention, Mr. President, the older I grow, the more apt I am to doubt my own judgment and to pay more respect to the judgment of others. Sir, I agree to this constitution with all its faults, if they are such, and I believe further that this constitution is likely to be well administered for a course of years and can only end in despotism, as other forms have done before it, when the people shall become so corrupted as to need despotic government being incapable of any other. He went on to say that he doubted that anyone could do any better than what they had done at that convention. Because when you get together a number of men, as he explained, that have in their collective mind their joint wisdom and their own prejudices and passions and errors, that it's difficult to come together. But he said this again, quote, on the whole, sir, I cannot help expressing a wish that every member of the convention who may still have objections to it, to the Constitution, would with me on this occasion doubt a little of his own infallibility and to make manifest our unanimity, put his name to this instrument. Franklin explained and asked his delegates to have unanimity. At the same time that that convention was closing and the words were being written down to create our constitution, I note that the president of the convention had something to say as well. Um, Interestingly, before I get to that, as you have all heard many times, the story of Elizabeth Powell of Philadelphia, 
the woman who was wise and politically astute and had a family who's had many mayors for the city of Philadelphia. She, of course, asked Benjamin Franklin, uh, Dr. Franklin, what sort of government have the delegates created, a republic or a monarchy? To which Franklin famously replied, a republic, if you can keep it. Now, I, I reflect that on that thought again and again because a republic is indeed not easy to keep. And what I wanted to discuss next was at the end of the convention, as the delegates did indeed sign to have the Constitution be the government potentially for all the United States, George Washington, who was elected president of the convention, he didn't say much during the convention itself. In fact, a lot of people were curious, curious how the convention went, and he didn't talk a lot about what happened at the convention. He did, however, write a letter that was the transmittal letter or cover letter of the Constitution to Congress. And we don't think about that letter often enough. It was written by Washington and in part with the help of Governor Morris, who incidentally also wrote the preamble of the Constitution. And this is what it said, among other things. I hope you reflect upon these words. Quote, the Constitution, which we now present, is the result of a spirit of amity and of that of mutual deference, which the peculiarity of our political situation rendered indispensable. Let me read that again. The Constitution, which we now present, is the result of a spirit of amity and of that of mutual deference, which the peculiarity of our political situation rendered indispensable. As Professor Haight would point out, the human mind is prepared for tribalism. George Washington understood that firsthand. He, however, explained to Congress and to the whole nation that it was the spirit of amity and of mutual deference that allowed the Constitution to exist. It is that spirit of amity which George Washington thought was indispensable that I'll talk about here a little bit later in this discussion. Now, before I talk about those five fundamental principles and the two unspoken principles of the Constitution, let me say a word about what I'm proposing. I propose that all lawyers and judges, those that know the Constitution and have an obligation to know it and to teach it, that they are the ones who must give thought to George Washington's admonition. Let the wise and the honest and those who understand the Constitution repair that standard and take it and carry it forward. In fact, I would ask that everyone who is a citizen of the United States consider their covenant of citizenship. In the United States of America, every federal judge, every lawyer, and every new citizen take an oath to the Constitution of the United States to sustain and defend the Constitution. I propose that that covenant or that obligation requires us to understand and to teach the principles of the Constitution, to have this recurrence of the fundamental principles of the Constitution. Indeed, our Constitution is the firm and sure foundation of government, established by the wisest raised up for that very purpose, the wisest among us. And it is to protect the rights and freedoms of all people throughout all the world. That is what is at stake. So let us understand that standard of freedom and let us have a recurrence to the fundamental principles as taught by our Constitution and our nation's greatest leaders. So let me now set forth what I believe are the five fundamental principles that everyone should know and think about. And every decision they make when it comes to government or leading, our political leaders in particular, would do well to think often about these principles. First, popular sovereignty. The people are the only lawful source of governmental power. Government is chartered by limited enumerated powers to be exercised only as authorized by the people according to the written law, which is the Constitution. The American experiment is unlike any in the world. In Europe, charters of liberty have been granted by power, James Madison explained. America has set the example of charters of power granted by liberty. Government derived not from the usurped power of kings, but from the legitimate authority of the people. Because America's government is of the people, by the people, and for the people, it must operate within the boundaries expressly enjoined from the people. Of these purpose, purposes, so elegantly set forth in the preamble of the Constitution, they're really the bookends of why we have government, the alpha and the omega, if you will, of government itself. It's for us to form a more perfect union 
and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. That is the true purpose of all government as rightly ordained by the people, to form a more perfect union and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Are we doing that? Principle number two, federalism. Generally understood, the principle of federalism is the division of political power and responsibilities between a centralized national authority and dispersed state or regional ones. The primary purpose of the people is to diffuse centralized power. For federalism, that's what it is about. As some would say, our founders split the atom of sovereignty, creating two political capacities, one state and one federal, each protected from incursion by the other. But I would recommend that we consider the deeper meaning of the word federalism. Consider its truest meaning and its truest idea as a principle. And to do that, I would suggest that we look at the word itself. The word federalism is derived from the Latin word fotus, meaning an alliance, treaty, compact, or more specifically, a covenant. Fotus comes itself from an older Latin word fides, meaning trust, faith, honor, or reliability. The concept reflects a mutual relationship with privileges and responsibilities on both sides. Federalism, therefore, could imply a collective political covenant, one we might think of as between people and the government they have chartered. The founders developed our constitutional system to create and fix this trust, this covenant between the American people and their government in perpetuity. The people would grant power to a new dual government, both nationally and regionally, premised upon their government's promise to safeguard and defend the people's liberty and civil rights from all enemies, including potentially future governments themselves. Too few in our national leadership today understand this covenant aspect of federalism. We as lawyers and judges and you as good citizens can help educate them. Principle number three, separation of powers. The people's government has three coordinate and equal branches of government. The people diffuse their power by spreading it out over these three purposes, the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary. Each has unique abilities to check and balance the others. The framers drew up a system of government that would confer sufficient power to govern while withholding the ability to abridge the liberties of the governed by separating the mighty powers to legislate, to execute, and to adjudicate providing each branch the means to resist the blandishments and incursions of others. Too few, again, today in our national leadership understand the significance of these wise restrictions on each branch of government. Too few refrain from the seductive tendency to venture into the field of a coordinate branch of government to which they were not elected nor appointed. We as lawyers and judges and as good citizens can help educate them and adhere to that principle at all times. Next, the Bill of Rights. But as a principle of the Constitution, I note that the people's enumeration of certain unalienable rights must be held inviolable by government. These include the freedom of religion. I wish we could spend a day on that one alone. There are so many wise purposes, as Washington explained in his farewell address and in other times, in the idea of honoring the freedom of conscience. In addition to the freedom of religion is the freedom of speech the freedom of the press, an independent and free press that's dedicated to pursuing the truth and providing that information to the people, not propagating their own opinions or those of a certain point of view. The right to peaceably assemble, the right to petition government for redress of grievances. No action by government should ever subvert these rights. Never are these rights more important, subject to greater danger, and in more need of defense than in times of a national crisis. I, I repeat the importance of the Bill of Rights in a times of a national crisis. I'll add to this that when we as citizens, civic leaders, educators, leaders of government, leaders of corporations, leaders of institutions, when we subvert these rights, even individually or as a corporation or an institution, that we endanger the very premise of the Constitution. We act contrary to the principles of the Constitution. In fact, I would su su suggest that 
every leader in the country, every leader of an organization has a right, a duty to honor the Bill of Rights. To act contrary to these principles of freedom on our own would be ultimately against our own self-interest. In the end, we would endanger the very political system that sustains us. Madison, James Madison warned against this very issue. He said, quote, liberty may be endangered by the abuses of liberty as well as by the abuses of power. Again, liberty may be endangered by the abuses of liberty as well as by the abuses of power. I know one of my favorite authors, Mark Twain, once said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. I would suggest that all of us, especially in these days, when we find ourselves on the side of the majority, take time to pause and reflect. We must hear one another. The rule of law. The principle of the rule of law means that all citizens are governed by and held accountable to laws that are just, publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated. Vague, incoherent, arbitrary, or unwritten law is no law at all. This is the foundational, these are the foundational principles of the Constitution. Uh, but the rule of law is in particular important, especially in our time right now. I would like to share with you a statement I made as a result and on the day of January 6, 2021. I, uh, on behalf of myself as the president of the Federal Bar Association, issued a statement that simply said, we as citizens of the United States honor the Constitution and the rule of law when we reject fear, anger, and anarchy. All have the right to protest, vote, and seek change peacefully under the law. None has the right to use violence or incite anarchy in response to political disappointments within a democracy. I invite all Americans to practice grace, civility, and understanding in public life. Let us always honor the rule of law. Now to these five fundamental constitutional principles, I want to add at least two more. Because to all the constitutional principles, and there are many, I believe there are several unspoken constitutional principles that manifest manifest themselves in the words in the context of the Constitution itself. In other words, by the example of what the Constitution is and by the example of the founders who put the Constitution together, there are other principles that we should understand and respect and emulate. Among these are hope, faith, knowledge, fortitude, resolution, patience, humility, diligence, order, justice, and gratitude. I'll add two more, unity and civic charity, or, or as Ger J Thomas Jefferson explained it, social love, understanding one another, seeing one another, hearing and, and being kind to one another. Let me talk about these two unspoken principles, unity and civic charity. I believe the Constitution's founding principles, properly understood, unceasingly teach us. Most remarkably, they have the ability to strengthen and unify our nation and its people. In fact, I'd invite everyone to reflect upon that again and again. The United States Constitution and its enduring principles of truth and freedom bind disparate people together as one national family. This is perhaps one of the least understood and grandest achievements of the United States Constitution. It at once liberates and unites. As I mentioned, Adams, Mace, uh, George Mason, and, and Franklin all explained often the importance of a recurrence to the founding principles. I'd like to end this discussion by referring to some of the words and teachings of three of our greatest leaders in times of a national crisis. I reflect upon these because they are appropriate now when we face some of the most perilous times that any of us have faced in our lifetimes, at least as a nation. So let me start going back to those words of George Washington. As I mentioned on 17 of September, 1787, with the cover letter to the United States Constitution, George Washington conveyed to Congress, and I believe this letter was always printed and submitted with the Constitution wherever it went throughout the United States to be ratified. And that letter invited all to consider how it was created. 
he again talked about the importance of the spirit of amity. And he said, we present it as the result of a spirit of amity and that of mutual deference. We could reflect upon that again. But I wanted to share with you the words from his farewell address. If everyone listening today could go themselves and their, have their children and their friends study again and again the farewell address of George Washington, we would be a better nation. I've studied it pretty carefully. In fact, I reflect upon it again and again. And I want to share with you some of the words that George Washington shared with you about this nation, and which I hope we will consider at this time in our nation's history. He said this, quote, you should properly estimate the immense value of your national union to your collective and individual happiness. He went on to say, you have in a common cause fought and triumphed together. The independence and liberty you possess are the work of joint councils and joint efforts of common dangers, sufferings, and successes. Your union ought to be considered as a main prop of your liberty and the love of the one ought to endear you to the preservation of the other. Your union ought to be considered as a main prop of your liberty and the love of the one ought to endear you to the preservation of the other. Think about what that means. Washington taught us in his lesson that the Constitution has this powerful truth and our history conveys this powerful truth. Unity is interconnected with and leads to the advancement of liberty. Liberty leads to happiness. Therefore, Washington revealed this great truth. Unity leads to individual and collective national happiness. I hope we learned that lesson. We should reflect on it over and over again. Next, let me share with you the words of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson gave his first inaugural address at a time of national divisiveness. As you probably know from your history, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists have a very different opinion on how the nation should proceed. They didn't like each other very much. And in fact, at the time of the first inaugural address of Jefferson, he realized, perhaps for the first time, that there were a lot of perils to a new republic beyond what he thought was important. And in fact, one of the most dangerous things for a new republic was the absolute enmity political tribes would have one to the other. So amidst this bitter election, he gave one of his most enlightened moments, perhaps. The bitter election that he experienced uh, gave Jefferson pause to consider a different threat to the young nation, as I mentioned. Beyond just the political differences, now undermining successful self-rule, and in many ways far more deleterious to liberty, was what, what Jefferson called and considered a dangerous lack of civic charity, or as he called it, social love among American citizens. Now, we don't think of that very often, but Jefferson did. In his inaugural address, of course, he famously said, we are all Republican, we are all Federalists. And we understand what that means. But we don't listen as carefully to what he said in addition to that. Less famously, Jefferson, and in some ways more importantly, shared these words in his inaugural address. Great wisdom. Quote, let us then, fellow citizens, unite with one heart and one mind. Let us restore to social intercourse that harmony and affection without which liberty and even life itself are but dreary things. He went on to say, it, and this was in a letter that followed up after his inauguration, in 1801, in a letter to <clears throat> Elbridge Jerry, he said this, it will be a great blessing to our country if we can once more restore harmony and social love among its citizens. I confess for myself, it is almost the first object of my heart and one to which I would sacrifice everything but principle. So Jefferson understood and saw the dangers of not having civic charity one to another. He deemed the idea of social love as a nation to be so important that liberty itself and life were but would be but dreary things unless we understood and got along as one American family. 
That's a profound teaching that I think we don't think about often enough. Finally, let me share the words of Abraham Lincoln, truly the greatest leader of America in a time of a national crisis. He gave us words that are really American scripture. And I won't do them justice, but I will read them to you so you can reflect upon his understanding of what we should be doing at the time of crisis. At his first inauguration, as the Civil War was upon us, and a plea that the nation be united, he spoke these words. I said some of them before. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. Lincoln implored us to listen to the better angels of our nature, to remember that we are one, that we are unified, and to not break the bonds of our national affection. Sadly, we did not listen. The Civil War came, Lincoln's plea for unity failed, and war was the consequence, a dramatic event that to this day affects every person living on the face of the earth, but in particular in the United States. Four years later, with victory at hand against the Confederacy, Lincoln gave his second inaugural address. And he launched his ambitious project to reconstruct a nation that had been torn asunder. His remarks at the time in the wake of the national tragedy and at a moment of promise have been described, in fact, I'll quote as a scholar has said, without precedent in the civil history of the world, giving voice to a generosity so grand and unexpected as to nearly defy human comprehension. Indeed, his words in the second inaugural address are what I would call American scripture. Here's some of them, the ones that we should all commit to memory. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds. With that charge, I suggest that we as American citizens must act and not be acted upon. I suggest that it's time for us to come together as a nation to remember what our forefathers and great national leaders have taught us and as lawyers and judges be the defenders of the Constitution, the defenders of liberty, and to carry on and forward the standard of which Washington spoke. I'll conclude with a few more thoughts and quotes. Judge Learned Hand gave a speech called The Spirit of Liberty in 1944. He said this in this speech, quote, the spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right which seeks to understand the minds of other men and women. I hope we understand that spirit of liberty. It is the spirit of not being too sure that we're right, but to try to understand the minds and the insights of other men and women. Another one of our most eloquent speakers was the brother of a great president. Senator Robert F. Kennedy spoke in 1968 at the event of the assassination of Martin Luther King. Ironically and sadly, shortly after he gave this quote, Robert F. Kennedy also had his life taken because of enmity. This is what Robert F. Kennedy said upon the assassination news of <clears throat> the news of assassination of Martin Luther King. Quote, what we need in the United States is not division, but love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. So I shall ask you tonight to return home to say a prayer for the family of Martin Luther King, but more importantly, to say a prayer for our own country, which all of us love. I would end with that admonition. May we as national leaders, lawyers, judges, 
good citizens of America, remember to, in our own way, in our own time, to say a prayer for our country, which all of us love. Though we differ in opinions and perspectives and backgrounds, the love we feel for one another and as an American family should be bonds that are never broken. The love we feel for each other must be constant. Unity makes us strong as a nation. Unity is the secret to our collective happiness. I'll end with one more quote, one of my favorite. Regardless of your religious background, the words of C.S. Lewis are worth repeating. He gave an essay called No Mere Mortals, and this is what he said, quote, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Now that is a true understanding of the nature of a soul, and it is what Americans understand. I'll end with encouragement. May each of us hear and understand the wise lessons of our Constitution, its fundamental principles, and the words of our founders. I believe the Constitution itself, like the words of our founders, including Washington's farewell address, are left to us for discovery. There are truths there that we need to understand. May the hand of providence continue to guide this nation and its leaders as it did our founders. In fact, our founders testified many times that it did. May all of those who serve our people of this great nation, including each of you as leaders in your communities, as lawyers and judges, and as good citizens, may each of you have humility and wisdom to understand and hear others and to have the power of unity and of civil charity. We are the United States of America one nation, one people, one American family. We follow that motto, e pluribus unum. May you have a good day. May God bless America. Thank you.